and welcome to 5-Minute Family Law. My name is John Paul Boyd, and I'm a family law lawyer practicing in Alberta and British Columbia. In this episode, I'm going to provide a stem to stern overview of the main changes to the Divorce Act that are coming into effect on the 1st of March 2021 as a result of Bill C-78. Now, this is a bit of an unusual episode for me because normally 5-Minute Family Law is all about trying to provide simple, plain language explanations of key family law concepts for the general public. This episode, however, is aimed at legal professionals, and the reason why I'm recording it is because a couple of days ago I posted to Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook um, some information about a series of webinars being offered by the Department of Justice covering what I'm going to be covering here. But I just found out today that all of those webinars are full, which is remarkable considering that there are like six or eight of them that had been scheduled. Um, however, since I've provided, uh, I don't know, at least a half dozen presentations on these changes for organizations like the Continuing Legal Education Society of British Columbia or the Legal Education Society of Alberta, I figured, well, I've already got the PowerPoint presentations made. I might as well just repackage them and give the presentation again. So this way, there's hopefully going to be some information about the changes being made available to my colleagues across Canada. And so without further ado, here is my PowerPoint and overview of the key changes to the Divorce Act. Some really important amendments to the Divorce Act are coming down the pike. These amendments are the result of Bill C-78, or an act to amend the Divorce Act. Bill C-78 cleared the House of Commons and the Senate on the 18th of June 2019, and even though it received royal assent the very next day, we still don't yet have an official consolidation available. If you want an unofficial consolidation, well, you can get one from me, from my website at www.boydarbitration.ca slash library. The amended Divorce Act was supposed to have come into force on Canada Day last year. However, as a result of certain delays resulting from COVID-19 and the need to amend court forms and such, it's been put off until the 1st of March 2021. There will be changes to the forms used to commence and respond to divorce claims, as well as new forms uh, that are going to be used to give notice of relocation and notice of objection to a proposed relocation. Consequential amendments are being made to a number of statutes, uh, but the most important ones from our point of view are the child support guidelines. The amendments to the guidelines were published in the Canada Gazette on the 8th of December 2020. Skip down to page 3305 rather than printing out the entire thing. Um, and you'll want to keep an eye out for changes to the language that we use about things like split custody and shared custody. But other than a change in terminology, there really aren't any important conceptual changes to the overall structure of the child support guidelines. The federal uh, government has been really good uh, about creating resources to support the changes to the Divorce Act. Most importantly, if you go to the website of the Department of Justice and you click on the, the link to family law, you'll see this page here under the heading of changes to family laws. And if you click on the button labeled information Pro for professionals, you'll find the really good stuff. This includes a general conceptual overview of the changes to the family law, uh, to the Divorce Act, as well as a more granular discussion about the specific changes to the Divorce Act. The overall discussion uh, will give you something that reads, you know, pretty much like a promotional brochure talking about why this is important and how Canada is better supporting children and families and things like that. The really important stuff you're going to find under the heading, The Divorce Act Changes Explained. This includes a section-by-section -section breakdown with a really helpful contrast of the new language compared to the old language, as well as a bit of an explanation about why those changes are being made. Um, here, by the way, uh, is what my consolidation looks like, and again, you can get that from my website at www.boydarbitration.ca, um, and uh, this is just a screen capture of the uh, Canada Gazette from the, 8th, from the 9th of December 2020 uh, with the changes to the child support guidelines and a few other regulations that are affected by Bill C-78. So let's uh, get into this and we'll dive into Bill C-78 starting with uh, the new language and new ideas that the bill talks about. First of all, and most importantly, we are ditching language such as custody and access. 
that kind of language, which is widely seen as promoting conflict between parents because it talks about the rights of parents rather than the entitlements of children, are being replaced with more child-centered language. This uh, child-centered language includes contact orders, which is the time a child might have with someone who is not a spouse. And we're going to be talking about the rights involved uh, in raising children in terms of decision-making responsibility, which is a language uh, that is really borrowed from provincial concepts about guardianship um, and language about parenting time. So um, rather than talking about custody orders, we're going to talk about parenting orders, which uh, which in turn discuss the responsibility for making significant decisions about a child's well-being and parenting time, which is how a child's uh, time is split up between spouses. Other new terms include the ambiguous family dispute resolution process, which is sort of a carry-all uh, term which refers to all out-of-court dispute resolution processes, even though only negotiation, collaborative negotiation, and mediation are specifically referred to. We have a new definition of family member, which is largely there for the purposes of discussions about family violence. The discussion of family violence, in turn, is brand new to the Divorce Act, and this is a really important definition because it comes into play in terms of how we think about evaluating the best interests of children. The term family violence is really broad. It includes conduct that is violent, conduct that is threatening, or constitutes a pattern of coercive control. And by the way, this means that the Federal Divorce Act and British Columbia's Family Law Act are really, I think, the only family law legislation in Canada that talks about coercive control. In any event, uh, family violence includes violent conduct, threatening conduct, conduct that demonstrates a pattern of coercive controlling behavior, uh, conduct that causes a family member to fear for their own safety or that of someone else, um, it's a broad term. It's not just physical uh, violence. It includes sexual abuse, harassment, financial abuse, psychological abuse, and of course, failure to provide the necessaries of life. And then we have an interesting term, uh, legal advisor, not lawyer. And you have to wonder what the federal government means by that, because I think it's meant to embrace changes that we see in some provinces like British Columbia and Ontario, where the ability to practice family law is being extended beyond a narrow definition of what a legal profession is. The other key new term that you're going to want to put in your diary is relocation. This is defined as a change in the residence of a child or of a person with parenting time or decision-making responsibility that is, quote, likely to have a significant impact on a child's relationship with someone with parenting time or decision-making responsibility, somebody who has an application in the works for a parenting order, or someone with contact. This is going to be really important because, as we'll talk about, the amendments to the Divorce Act include a brand spanking new test to help the court figure out applications on mobility. Um, first, however, there's some pretty dry stuff uh, about jurisdiction under the Act. Amendments are being made to sections 3, 4, and 5. Um, the important things here are that we're getting rid of the test about ordinary residents and we're replacing it with language about habitual residents, which is more in keeping with some of the uh, established law, uh, particularly about uh, interjurisdictional, international rights about uh, custody, care, and control of children and so forth. So now, instead of talking about ordinary residents, we're talking ha about habitual residents. And it's habitual residents that is in most cases going to be the determining factor in, in terms of which court has jurisdiction to hear a divorce claim. Um, there is going to be an amendment to Section 6, and you'll remember that Section 6 uh, involves claims to uh, claims about custody or access where the child is habitually resident in another jurisdiction. 
uh, paired with uh, the existing Section 6 and the change about habitual residence, we have a new Section 6.1 that's going to address uh, transfers of uh, Divorce Act claims where there's an application for a contact order. So Section 6 then is going to talk about uh, parenting order in terms of uh, orders about parenting time and decision-making responsibility. Section 6.1 deals separately with contact. And again, it's the same thing. Um, and it's probably not going to surprise you. It's about habitual residence, and it's about which court is better placed to hear and determine the application. I strongly suspect that the uh, case law that's going to build up under Section 6.1 won't be significantly different than the existing uh, case law under Section 6. What we're talking about are the child's connections to the community, the place where the majority of evidence is going to be available to help the court make, make a determination about contact. And then we're going to have a brand new section 6.2 that concerns instances where a child is wrongfully removed from or kept in a particular province. And again, we're talking about habitual residence, but there's exceptions to this, right? And so the habitual residence test will not prevail um, unless uh, the all persons, uh, object, uh, all persons who could have objected have consented or acquiesced to the wrongful removal. If the the person who's got the complaint is responsible for an undue delay in arguing about the child's wrongful removal or retention, or if that other, or if that other province, the province in which the child is physically present, is again better placed to hear and determine the application. If any of those exceptions are there, then the court must transfer the application to the province in which the child is habitually resident. And then we have the third new jurisdictional test under Section 6.3, which deals with cases where the child is not habitually resident in Canada and the court's jurisdiction to make orders here affecting a child that's located somewhere else. Then we also have these really interesting new duties of spouses, lawyers, and the court. And you'll recall that under the current Divorce Act, the only people that have duties, so to speak, are judges and lawyers. So the new duties to parties are set out in brand new sections 7.1 through 7.6. Um, and these duties say that people with parenting time and decision-making responsibility or contact are obliged to exercise those entitlements in a manner consistent with the best interests of the child. Another new obligation requires a party to protect a child from conflict arising from the lawsuit. The parties must attempt to resolve disputes through family dispute resolution, and you'll remember that that's a brand new defined term that basically refers to out-of-court dispute resolution services. And a really important new duty requires the parties to provide each other with complete accurate and up-to-date information. Combined with sections 20 and 21 of the Child Support Guidelines, this is a really important new obligation that I expect in most provinces and territories will marry nicely with the existing rules of court and provide that, that good and important ongoing responsibility to exchange information to ensure that everybody is kept up to date. Um, and finally, the parties themselves are going to be required to certify that they are aware of these duties in the court forms that are used to commence or respond to Divorce Act pleadings. Now, um, for lawyers or legal advisors, uh, our duties are set out at Section 7.7. .7. Our old duties at Section 9 of the current Divorce Act are reproduced in 7.7, .7, which means that we still have the obligation to tell people about the facilities that are known to us uh, to promote reconciliation uh, and, require, and that we're required to talk to our clients about the importance of resolving uh, disputes about children other than through litigation. Um, our new duties include an, a positive duty to encourage our clients to resolve disputes through out-of-court processes. The court has some new duties under Section 7.8. 
Um, these are in addition to the existing duties under section 9 and 10. Um, those duties, you'll recall, are about things like the court's obligation not to grant a divorce if it is not satisfied that an appropriate amount of child support is being paid, um, the court's obligation not to grant a divorce if it appears to the court that reconciliation is possible, and so on. Under section 7.8, um, the court is going to be required uh, when it's hearing uh, applications about the care and control of children, whether or not there is a civil protection order or proceedings underway, uh, whether there is a child protection order or child protection proceedings underway. And so that's that's referring to cases where the child protection authorities are involved and whether or not there are any criminal law orders or proceedings, undertakings or recognizance underway. So this is really important and it's meant to fill in a hole um, that exists under most provincial and territorial legislation and certainly under the existing Divorce Act about the, the obligation of the court or perhaps the entitlement of the court to take into account what's going on in proceedings involving the same people that are not family law or divorce proceedings. Um, and you'll see a, a similar kind of obligation in certain legislation, such as uh, British Columbia's Family Law Act in the part of the act that talks about the appointment of people who are not parents as guardians. And this is meant to sort of oblige the court to consider all of these sort of extraneous uh, events that are occurring outside the Divorce Act proceeding that in previous, uh, in, in pre, under previous legislation, it wasn't necessarily obliged to do. Um, and so the, and the difficulty here, of course, is that uh, in most jurisdiction, uh, the courts, the, the, the computer systems that uh, are used by court staff to enter information about civil disputes don't usually talk uh, to the court systems used in criminal disputes. And there are other problems about things like, you know, the misspelling of names or names that uh, are spelled one way or ordered one way in one proceeding and not in the other. So uh, that's just a babbling way of me expressing concern about the ability of the courts to identify whether a person involved in a Divorce Act proceeding is the same person who might be involved in a child protection proceeding, uh, in a civil protection order proceeding, or in a criminal proceeding. So we're going to have problems here, but the overall point of this is to give the court better information about other things that are relevant to the child's best interests that are not necessarily apparent on its face in Divorce Act proceedings. Proceedings. Now, speaking about the best interests of children, we have a radically expanded new series of tests that appear at Section 16 of the Divorce Act. You'll recall that under the current Divorce Act, um, Section 16 really says almost nothing about how the court is to figure out what the best interests of children are, apart from section 16 sub 10 about the maximum contact principle. But apart from that, the Divorce Act right now says almost nothing about how to figure out what the best interests of children are. Under the new section 16, the court is required to give primary consideration to these, these three overriding factors, which are the child's physical, emotional, and psychological safety, security, and well-being. Those three dominant primary factors are subject to a whole shopping list of these additional factors. Um, and these additional factors, you know, look, smell, and feel a lot like the additional factors that you see in provincial legislation, such as Alberta's Family Law Act, Ontario's Child, uh, child Legislation, uh, and British Columbia's Family Law Act, uh, because it, it seems to me, at least, that the provincial legislation has always gone on at much greater detail uh, in terms of giving the court and parties assistance in thinking about the relevant factors. But the Divorce Act has always, almost, you know, has said virtually nothing about what those uh, factors are. Um, so the new, so the, the bit about the three primary factors appears at section 16 sub 2. 
the factors that are to be brought to your mind and to the attention of our clients when, when evaluating the impact of those three primary factors are listed at section 16 sub 3 and when family violence is a factor, section 16 sub 4. Um, I'll pause again to say that um, this is a structure of evaluating children's best interests that you will see almost word for word in British Columbia's Family Law Act, which was clearly the federal government's inspiration for uh, developing the structure and way of thinking about children's best interests. So um, the section 16 sub 3, oh yes, and I'm sorry, the reason why I mentioned the British Columbia legislation is because uh, I suspect that the case law developing in British Columbia are going to be extremely useful in the initial stages of figuring out what the Divorce Act has to say about things, just because the British Columbia legislation is so very close to how the federal legislation has wound up being worded. All right, getting into those, uh, those I guess, subordinate factors at section 16 th sub 3. They include the child's needs, given the child's age and stage of development, the nature of the child's relationships with other people, including not just the spouses, but the child's siblings, grandparents, other family members, and other people who have an important role in the child's life, that the each spouse's willingness to support the child's relationship with the other spouse, that's an important factor. The history of the child's care, and here's a really important point that follows up on Canada's obligations and our obligations under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. It is the child's views and preferences, unless they cannot be ascertained. So the really important thing about this particular language is that it creates a, a presumption that the child's views and preferences will be heard subject uh, to the ability of the objecting party to prove that those views and preferences cannot be ascertained. That's a pretty high burden, and the test about not being able to be ascertained is going to be difficult. I suspect that the inability to ascertain the child's views and preferences will be probably based on the child's age um, and the presence of any developmental or learning disabilities that impact the child's ability to express their views and preferences. Um, the factors continuing uh, on under section 16 sub 3 include the each spouse's plans for the child's care, um, the ability of the spouses to care for and meet the needs of the child, and so forth. Um, the other really important development under the new version of the Divorce Act is a mandatory in injunction requiring the court to consider the presence of family violence and its impact on the best interests of the child. Specifically, its impact on a party's ability to care for the child and the appropriateness of any order requiring the spouses to cooperate. And then this is following up on the court's new duties under section 7. Point, what is it? Section 7.8 or something like that the existence of any civil or criminal proceedings that are relevant to the child's safety. Now, again, this pattern follows how uh, the best interest tests is structured in British Columbia's Family Law Act. One of the factors includes the presence of any family violence. And if family violence is, is found, uh, the court in British Columbia is required to refer to a second list of subordinate factors to help the court assess how uh, the, the, the existence of family violence has impacted on the ability of spouses to care for the child. Under the Divorce Act, if family violence is a factor at section 16 sub 3 sub j, the court must turn to section 16 sub 4 to a secondary list of factors to help the court assess the impact of family violence. This includes the nature, seriousness, and frequency of the family violence, whether there is a pattern of coercive controlling behavior, whether the family violence was directed to a child, whether the child was directly or indirectly exposed to the family violence, and so on. So this is, in other words, a brand new way to think about the best interests of children, and the injunction to consider the the impact of family violence is something that is simply invisible under the current Divorce Act, and it requires us to think about how we assess 
the needs of children and their best interests in a brand new way. This must be taken seriously. So um, moving on to talk about the new language that we use uh, in terms of parenting after separation. Under section 16 sub 1, people can apply for orders about parenting time or decision-making responsibility. Collectively, orders about parenting time or decision-making responsibility are called parenting orders. The people who have standing to apply for a parenting order are spouses, of course, and, and this is really important, quote, a person other than a spouse who is a parent of the child, so we're talking about non-spouse parents, a person other than a spouse who stands in the place of a parent or who intends to stand in the place of a parent. This is really important because normally these people do not have standing to apply for a parenting order. Their standing is limited to applying for a contact order, and we'll talk about that in just a second. When the court is making, making a parenting order, it can also make orders allocating parenting time, and otherwise, in other words, just creating a schedule of the child's time between the spouse's homes. Uh, the court can make a order allocating decision-making responsibility, um, which is what we often see uh, under the provincial legislation, such that one spouse might have responsibility, for example, for health care, while the other spouse might have responsibility for education. Normally, and in most cases, though, decision-making responsibility, I expect, will not be allocated discreetly to one spouse or the other. That will be reserved for cases where spouses are in elevated levels of contact. I expect that, that this part of the Divorce Act is going to unfold such that there will be an almost unspoken presumption in favor of the sharing of decision-making responsibilities, such that each spouse will usually be required to talk to the other spouse when making important decisions about the kids. Um, the court, when it's making a parenting uh, order, can also uh, impose limits and requirements on communication between people. In other words, you know, um, you can't call each other after a certain time at night or your communications have to only happen by email or by text and so on and so forth. Um, under Section 16.2, the court now has exclusive authority uh, to, uh, sorry, a person who has parenting time has exclusive authority to make day-to-day -day decisions affecting the child. This is uh, important because it creates a presumption that when a child is with a spouse during that spouse's parenting time, they're going to be able to make day-to-day uh, -day decisions uh, about matters without having to, to consult the other spouse, as would normally be required. But what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a cluster of really humdrum, unimportant things, such as will the child wear sandals or rubber boots? Uh, but we're also talking though about more important things like the child just broke their leg you know how do we deal with that so it means that that parent can take the child to the hospital without having to wor worry about first contacting the other spouse and getting permission for that and as i was just talking about the court also has the ability under section 16.3 to either allocate decision-making responsibility to one spouse alone or to order that a parenting responsibilities be shared under section 16.4, and this is another really important part, and it follows up on existing rights that you see currently under the Divorce Act, someone who has parenting time or decision-making responsibility is entitled to get information about the child's well-being, health, and education from anybody who has that information, including the other spouse and people who are not spouses, such as doctors, dentists, teachers, coaches, and all that. Now that's important because people who have contact do not have these rights, whether they're a spouse, a parent, or not. Now, contact orders are addressed under section 16.5. What that section says is that someone who is not a spouse can apply for contact with a child. Those people must get leave of the court first. Now, 
who is going to be asking for contact? Most of the time, uh, we're talking about grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, interested and involved third parties, just the way we see right now. But those people, just as the legislation currently provides, has to get leave first. I should mention, because I don't think I did, that when somebody who is not a spouse is applying for a, con uh, a parenting order, they have to get leave too. When a non-spouse is applying for a contact order, the court has to consider, quote, all relevant factors, which is pretty non-specific, but you can imagine what those factors are going to uh, include. When the court does make a contact order, it can impose terms and conditions as it sees fit on the exercise of contact. Here are some more uh, important ideas. There's a definition of, of the term parenting plan, which under section 16.6 .6 is a document or a part of a document. And for that, you could read separation agreement, minutes of settlement, memoranda of agreement, things like that, uh, which talk about parenting time and decision-making responsibility and contact. So it's a really broad term and it essentially refers to any document, whether it's an agreement or an order or any other thing that's scribbled on a cocktail napkin that already talks, that, that talks about these particular parenting after separation issues. Now, when there is a parenting plan in place, under section 16.6, .6, the court is required to include that parenting plan in any parenting order or contact order it makes, unless it's not in the child's best interests to do so. Why would the Department of Justice make this particular provision? And the only thing I can think about uh, is that the court is, is be, in, in terms of the court being required to include agreed parenting plans in its orders, it's to make those parenting plans more easily enforceable in the event of a breach. Now, uh, the other huge change to the Divorce Act is the inclusion of a new statutory test to deal with relocation. At present, the only jurisdictions that, e that even talk about a test on relocation are British Columbia's Family Law Act and the, and the relatively recently amended legislation in Nova Scotia. Under the new uh, amendments to the Divorce Act, under section 16.8, there is a distinction between moves that qualify as relocations, and I'll, get to, I'll give you a refresher on that definition in a second, and moves that do qualify as relocation. The, te the definition of relocation is a move that is likely to impair the child's relationship with another spouse or another in person uh, who is uh, important in the child's life. Now, when a proposed move of the parent or the parent and the child um, is made and does not qualify as relocation, the person who is planning on moving, again, with or without the child, is required to notify everyone else who has parenting time, decision-making responsibility or contact of their intention to move. That notice must be given in writing. It must state the date of the proposed move and it must provide the new address and contact information of the child and the person who is moving. This notice, the requirement to give notice, can be exempted if there is a risk of family violence, but this exemption can only be granted by the court. However, you can apply for the exemption without being required to give notice to the other people who have parenting time, decision-making responsibility, or contact. Here is where it gets heavy. When a move does qualify as a relocation, under section 16.9, the person who is proposing to move, and again, with or without the child, is required to give 60 days notice to any person with parenting time, decision-making responsibility, or contact. That notice must be in writing. It must state the date of the proposed relocation. It must provide the new address and contact information for the moving spouse and the child. And it must state, a, it must provide a proposal by the moving person 
about how parenting time, decision making, or contact will be exercised or could be exercised after a relocation occurs. Somebody who has contact is, uh, is entitled to, give, to get that notice, but is not entitled to object. That appears at section 16.96. So remember that even though someone who has contact is entitled to notice of a proposed relocation, there's bugger all they can do about it. Now, things are a bit different, however, if the person has parenting time or contact. As a general rule, somebody who complies with the notice obligation will be allowed to relocate if the relocation is authorized by the court or if someone who has parenting time or decision-making responsibility has not replied to the notice within 30 days. So you've got a 30-day window only if you have parenting time or decision-making responsibility to object. And if you don't object within the, that 30 days, then there's a presumption in favor of the relocation being allowed to occur. The test the court is required to consider when an objection is filed appears at section 16.92. The court will now be required to consider the reasons for the proposed relocation, the impact that the proposed relocation will have on the child, the time spent by the child with each person with parenting time, and the level of involvement with those people in the children's life. The court will be required to look at whether or not the moving spouse complied with the notice requirements and whether there is any award from an arbitrator, any existing court order, or any agreement that restricts the spouse's ability to move. Now, things get a bit hairy under section 16.93 when we're talking about the burden of proof. Here's the deal. Under section 16.93, if the child spends, quote, substantially equal time in the care of each spouse, then the person who wants to move has the burden of proving that the relocation will be in the child's best interests. On the other hand, if the person who is planning on moving has the child for the vast majority, quote unquote, of the child's time, the burden shifts then the burden falls on the person, the other person, who does not have the vast majority of the child's time. They have the burden of, of showing that the proposed relocation is not in the child's best interests. Now, in those middle cases where the child's time is neither shared substantially equally nor devoted almost the vast majority to one parent, each spouse has the burden of proof to show that the relocation as proposed is or is not in the best interests of the child. Now, let's pause and think about why the Department of Justice chose those terms substantially equal and vast majority. Now, because this really is a bit of a head scratcher, uh, because as you will expect, there is no statutory definition of what substantially equal or vast majority might mean. And of course, the court could have, instead of just saying substantially equal, could have said equal. We all know what equal means. Equal is a mathematical concept. It's 50-50 or it's not equal. Or the court could, uh, sorry, or the Department of Justice could have referred the, to the definition of shared custody at section nine of the Divorce Act, you know, the 40% rule. Now that would have been helpful because the child support guidelines have been in force since 1997 and we have this massive body of case law built up that helps us know whether or not parenting time is shared uh, equally or not, or close to it. So if the court had said, uh, you know, had, had relied instead of saying substantially equal, but relied on the definition of shared custody under section nine of the, of the child support guidelines, we would have been able to figure that out. But instead, it's substantially equal, a different concept. Likewise, when we're talking about vast majority, well, the court, the, the Department of Justice could have said vast majority. Uh, it could have said mere majority. It could have said 90% or more or something like that. But 
in choosing these ambiguous, amorphous, undefined terms, what the court is doing is the court is shoving us back into a Gordon and Gertz analysis, which requires that highly contextualized, individualized way of looking at not just children with writ large, but this particular child of this particular family in these particular circumstances. So it's putting us back into a case-by-case -case analysis. And while this, without a doubt, complies with the decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada going back into time immemorial, and most notably the comments made by the former Chief Justice McLaughlin, and all of that is tremendously important and philosophically sound, it means that when we are advising our clients, we're going to have a lot of problem, uh, at least at first, being able to predict whether or a relocation is likely to occur or not. We're going to have to wait till another massive body of case law accumulates in order to be able to tell our clients whether they have substantially equal time or not. So it's problematic and it's going to be expensive uh, and it's, it creates an impediment to accessing justice because as lawyers, we're, we're not going to know what the answer is going to be for quite some time, which is going to be shoving people into court. On the other hand, it also provides that highly contextualized analysis that so many Supreme Court of Canada decisions have said is required. All right, so moving on and to the last part of this presentation, interjurisdictional stuff. Um, the really important changes are about what's going to happen when an application is made to uh, get or vary uh, an order for support and the respondent lives in another jurisdiction. The good news is that we are finally ditching the process for provisional orders and confirming orders at sections 18 and 19, and we're replacing that with a much longer list of, uh, of requirements that are more that have, you know, in terms of their overall flavor, a much greater degree of resemblance to the Interjurisdictional Support Orders Acts that exist in every province and territory and in a number of reciprocating jurisdictions outside of Canada. And the main effect of this is to provide that kind of one-stop shopping service that the ISOA legislation provides at present. So what will happen is that just like under the ISOA, uh, somebody who needs to apply for a brand new order or to change an order or a recalculation uh, applies through the local provincial authority. The provincial authority forwards the application to the courts of, a, of the other province where the spouse is resident and the application uh, winds up getting heard in that particular province. So this is on the whole good news. Um, I think it's going to drive a lot of lawyers nuts because we don't have the ability to easily argue in our jurisdiction because the application is always heard in the jurisdiction where the respondent resides. However, that is the process under the ISOA legislation which has been in force, I think, for at least 10 years, if not more. There are other amendments coming that will address other uh, inter interjurisdictional obligations, um, such as uh, the Convention on the Recovery of Child Support, uh, the Convention on Jurisdiction uh, and Enforcement with respect to parenting rights and parenting after separation, uh, other obligations about how uh, orders uh, for support are enforced, and other, uh, other federal legislation about the garnishment of wages and pensions and stuff like that. So um, that was uh, a long and doubtless confusing overview of the upcoming changes to the Divorce Act. Again, uh, don't forget that you can download a consolidated, an unofficial uh, consolidation of the Divorce Act from my website at www.boydarbitration.ca slash library. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about the changes to the Divorce Act, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Thanks very much, and I hope this was useful. Thank you.